I have a show and tell this morning. I also have a decoy show and tell that we're going to put on the screen. May I have the decoy show and tell? That's to distract you from the real show and tell, <laughs> which is, I'll tell you in a moment. So your real show and tell is right here. You've got these lovely purple hymnals in front of you if you are so interested. Um, and the, the particular page of the lovely purple hymnal that I call your attention to is page number 340. Uh, the hymn, This Is My Song. And uh, that uh, tune uh, will be Esther's gift of music following the scripture reading this morning. And so if you want to read words as well as listen to music during the gift of music, you can do that so you've been shown and told, yeah? Okay, so I need to tell you a little bit about this music. Uh, this music is composed by that guy. Um, that's the decoy. Um, the decoy's name is Jean Sibelius. He was a Finnish composer. Uh, he wrote this song about 123 years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, the country of Finland uh, was under the control of the Russian Empire. And um, as part of the Russian imperial control, uh, Finnish art and culture was heavily censored. So um, Sibelius was kind of uh, working against that and working to develop a Finnish national identity um, under that uh, control and repression by uh, the Russian Empire of the time. And so he composed uh, this tune, Finlandia, um, composed it actually as part of a longer piece that was uh, music to accompany some visual uh, presentations about Finnish history. And um, so Finnish history sort of playing out in little tableaus on stage while the orchestra plays, and toward the end of the piece, this tune, Finlandia, that you will hear in just a few minutes, um, sort of emerges as this sense of an awakening Finnish identity um, that Sibelius is working on composing into the music here. Uh, not too long after that tune, Finlandia, was sort of pulled out to become its own piece, and it received some patriotic lyrics in Finnish uh, later on, and we know it typically as the setting for some Christian hymns. Uh, we know it as the setting for Be Still My Soul and for the tune that Esther will play for us, This Is My Song, these words uh, that you can read in the hymnal. Those words were written in 1934 as a direct response to the global rise of nationalism. And so this uh, takes a Finnish national hymn and transforms it to be, this is my song, O God, of all the nations, to resist the idea that God loves one country more than other countries around the world. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. 1934 was one of those times as nationalism was really sweeping the globe and uh, culminated at that time in World War II in which Finland was on the wrong side for reasons that make sense if you're in Finland. But sometimes we have to be reminded of what we already know, which is that God is the God of all the nations, and God intends for all peoples to be free and safe. So this Memorial Day weekend is full of national imagery here in the United States when we rightly honor those who died in service to the country. And we acknowledge that it can be really easy to, to cross over from that patriotic love of country crossing over into nationalist idolatry. And so I want to invite you to, to let this song um, be our celebration, uh, not only of this country, but of the many uh, peoples and nations in the world, and above all, uh, to allow this song to lead us in a prayer for peace. And first, our scripture reading. We'll have the prayer for illumination. 
living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the New Testament, John 21, verses 20 to 25. And please join me if you would. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true, but there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the word itself could not contain the books that would be written. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. This is not a Memorial Day sermon. I have to make that clear because I have to answer to my dad for this. And I have told you this before, that my dad insists on the understanding that Memorial Day is about the ones who died, not about the ones who lived. And that's not to discount the ones who died, of course. We will pray for them and for their families. I will watch the concert from the Capitol this evening, and I assure you I will tear up at all the right times. And above all, I will pray for the day when we never again send brave young people to kill and to die for their countries. I will pray for the day when the Lord breaks the rifle and shatters the drone and peace indeed is upon all the earth. Memorial Day is about remembrance and gratitude and deep lament. This is not a Memorial Day sermon because it is easier for us to keep faith with those who die than it is to devote ourselves to those who live. It is easier for us to set out flags at cemeteries than it is to heal limbs and brains, to treat moral injury and chemical dependency and post-traumatic stress disorder among those who come back. It is easier for us to memorialize law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty than it is to change the conditions in our communities. It is apparently easier for us to memorialize fourth graders than it is to imagine that the right to bear arms comes along with responsibilities and limits. By myself, I don't have anything to say to a culture that would rather honor people's death than care for their lives. So I'm not going to talk about death today. I almost have to because of where this scripture reading lands in the story of John's gospel. This story from John's gospel, it comes right after what we read last week when Jesus told Peter about the death that Peter eventually would die as his way of literally and heroically being martyred as testimony to God's glory. 
So Jesus has just said that to Peter as they walk along this shoreline, and they turn around and they see this disciple that Jesus loved. That's the only name that this disciple ever gets in the gospel. Peter turns and sees the disciple that Jesus loves following them, and Peter asks, well, what will happen to him? Peter's always good at changing the subject when Jesus gets real, isn't he? Peter's actually got this particular habit of placing that beloved disciple between himself and Jesus. Or maybe more charitably, Peter is very concerned about what this all means for that disciple that Jesus loves. Maybe Peter feels responsible. Maybe Peter is worried for this other disciple's safety. So Jesus has just said to Peter, this is what your death will look like. And Peter turns around and says, Lord, what about him? What about this other disciple? Well, Jesus wants nothing to do with that question. This is not a Memorial Day sermon. Jesus says, well, I could keep that disciple alive forever, and what difference does that make to you? Your job is to be faithful to me in the life that you have. We have to learn Peter's lesson over and over again. We have to learn Peter's lesson over and over again that there is more than one way to be faithful. There is more than one way to bear witness to Jesus' life in our lives and the life of the world. Peter learned how to be faithful in part by hearing Jesus tell him what his death would look like. And this disciple Jesus loved Well, this disciple Jesus loved will learn the same lesson about how to be faithful in almost exactly the opposite way. Peter knows uh, that he will eventually die in a particular way with Jesus, and that somehow sets Peter free to live as a witness, as testimony to the good news of Jesus' resurrection. There's great news in that. And this disciple that Jesus loved, he receives nearly the opposite news, the imagine that you would never die. And through that develops this tremendously long view of life that leads him to a kind of wisdom that we can only hope for. It's possible for our death to glorify God, and it is possible for our lives to do the same. That disciple Jesus loved goes on to spend his life testifying to Jesus' risen life in the world, including as the narrator of this gospel and as the source of a wisdom tradition that also gave us three letters signed in John's name and the book of Revelation, all coming from the wisdom of this, what would it look like if you were to remain alive until Jesus returns in glory. That written testimony remains with us whether or not the narrator died eventually. Jesus said to us that doesn't matter and Jesus is right as usual. And it's not just this writing, not even just all those writings in that Bible that we read from every week. As the narrator says right here, the world itself cannot contain all the stories of Jesus' love and grace of Jesus' resurrection living in the world today. Next week, we're going to celebrate Pentecost. So this is the very last Sunday of the Easter season, and we're standing on the cusp of this season when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit that sends the church out into the world to bear witness to Jesus' life continuing in the world today, the life of the triune God. We enter this season bearing witness to how the church continues Jesus' incarnation right here in this building, in this community, in this world today. So the good news today, as we wrap up this Easter season, the good news is that Jesus has countless ways to heal and transform the world. There are countless signs and testimonies to Jesus' resurrection in the world today, The life of the church is a sign not of death, but ultimately a sign of Christ's 
life in the world. So how can we bear witness to life today? How can we bear witness to life, especially when it is so much easier to honor death instead? Whether we're talking about kids or veterans or the communities in which we live today, how can we serve life? Well, the good news is still good, that there are countless ways for us to do that. There are literally countless angles into the faithful service that nurtures Christ's life in the world. Anytime that we testify that the power of healing is greater than the power of violence, anytime we lay down our weapons and our weaponized language so that we can sow trust and reconciliation in the world, we are serving life. We serve life anytime we set aside our perfect ideals, whether they're ideals of liberty or of tranquility or of something else. Anytime we set those aside so that we can pursue the changes that literally directly save lives in the world today, we are serving life. We serve life anytime we keep promises to those who have served this country with honor. We serve life anytime we keep the promises that we make to the children that we welcome at baptism and who represent our cherished hopes for the world. We serve life anytime we open ourselves to be changed in order that we can offer genuine welcome. Genuine welcome to people with unique mental health needs, unique gender or sexual identities, unique racial or ethnic backgrounds, unique neurological makeups, any time we invite ourselves to be changed so that God's people might be welcomed and loved, we are serving life. There are countless ways to live out the gospel. The world itself cannot contain the volumes that would be written if each of us were to live out that gospel in this life right now, today. So let our lives make known the life of the risen Christ among us now and always. Amen. Our moment for mission lifts up our partners at DMARC. On Thursday, our partners at DMARC hosted the grand opening of their new facility at 100 Army Post Road on the south side of Des Moines. It had been just seven years since DMARC moved into their previous facility on Mulberry Street, but the organization had very quickly outgrown the warehouse and office space that was available there. Food insecurity continues to increase in Greater Des Moines, and it's crucial that DMARC be able to respond to that need. But it is equally as important to focus attention on addressing the root causes of hunger and food insecurity. DMARC's new facility offers triple the amount of available warehouse space and far more cold storage capacity so that they can handle larger donations of food. It offers more offices and meeting spaces for staff and volunteers. It offers new training and community rooms, overnight indoor storage for the mobile food pantry vehicles, and a permanent on-site food pantry on the south side of Des Moines where there is so much need. Covenant's youth group worked at the new facility two weeks ago. They got there before I did. They were sorting donations from the Stamp Out Hunger food collection. Uh, because this new facility has so much more capacity, we no longer need to sort all of those donations in one week out at the fairgrounds. At the annual meeting on Thursday following the grand opening, DMARC welcomed new board members, including Tara Kramer, who is also a food pantry client. A few years ago, Tara sat down to share just a bit of her experience coming to a DMARC food pantry. And we have a brief video from Tara. I felt like I was at home. 
I came inside the door. Somebody personally welcomed me. Um, everybody was smiling. I got hugs, and people wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable and safe. Covenant contributes a portion of our Mission in Action budget to DMARC every quarter, including a portion of what you give today. So thank you so much for your support.